today I'm going to be discussing one-sided limits. Now recall that previously if I had told you let x tend to the value 2 when evaluating a limit, then how would we have assessed this on a number line? So if I draw a number line with the number 2, then when we say x tends to 2, well, of course this is on the x-axis, then this amounts to us actually taking values that are arbitrary, arbitrarily close to 2. And observe that we now approach 2 from both directions, from the left and from the right. So when we talk about one-sided limits, we are essentially talking about approaching a number from one side only, meaning either from the left, which is what I've just circled, or only from the right, which is what I've circled on the other side. So for all values that are less than 2, so for this region here, we say that we term this below, or alternatively we call this from the left. And for all values on the number line that's bigger than 2, we term this on the, uh, let's, okay, I'll write down above, or sometimes you'll find people refer to it from the right. So graphically speaking, this does make sense. The values above 2 are on the right-hand side and the values below 2 are on the left-hand side. <clears throat> so once again, how do I express this in arrow notation? So then in arrow notation, when I'm talking about approaching 2 from the left, we then write down x arrow 2, but now I place a superscript above the 2 and I write down a minus to denote that it was from the left. And when I talk about values on the right, if x is being approached from values on the right, then I write down x arrow 2 with a superscript of plus. So in general, keep in mind this notation when we're talking about one-sided limits, we are only working with one of these two cases, either below or above, which means either the left or the right, and make sure you understand the notation. So let's look at the graph that I've got drawn here. So this is f of x on the xy plane. And um, what I would like us to do is evaluate what's happening around the x value 2. So we are now going to evaluate the one-sided limits. So let's firstly calculate the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 from the left, meaning it's approaching from below. So if I go to the number line, and if I approach from below, meaning in that direction, what is actually happening to the f of x value? So as I approach x, uh, as I approach 2 from the left, observe that I, f of x approaches the value of 1. So that is precisely what's happened. So the limit as x approaches 2 from the left is 1. Right, and that is the limit of f of x. Now let's consider what's happening to f of x as we approach 2 from the right hand side. So if I'm talking from the right, I'm now referring to all the values above 2, which means this is what I am now doing on the number line. And what consequently happens to f of x? So as x approaches 2 from above, observe that f of x approaches 3. So that means that the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 from above is 3. And another important thing to note that from this example we can clearly see that the one-sided limits need not equal to one another. So these are not equal. Now one of the purposes of going through this section on one-sided limits is that it assists us to determine the existence of limits in general. So I have a theorem of existence which I have provided to you in your notes and it tells you that the limit of some function f of x as x approaches an x value of a will equal to L, meaning the limit exists, if and only if the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the left is L, and the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the right is also L. So what this essentially tells you is that the limit exists if the left-hand limit equals to the right-hand limit. And in particular, the value of the limit will be the value that both the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit take on. 
This is an if and only if statement, meaning you can read it in the forward direction and in the reverse. So based on this, if you know that a limit exists, then you can conclude that the left-hand limit will equal to the right-hand limit. And going in reverse, if you know that the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit equal to one another, then you know that the limit exists. So in particular, using this theorem and applying it to what we have here, I have that the left-hand limit does not equal to the right-hand limit. So therefore, the limit does not exist. So the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x, so the general limit, does not exist. So keep this type of application in mind. Right, the next thing to cover is limits at infinity. So when we're referring to limits at infinity, I'm referring to limits of the following form. The limit of a function as x approaches positive infinity or the limit of some function as x approaches negative infinity. Now when it comes to problems of this nature, there is an important rule that we need to keep in mind. I'm going to just label this here, star. And it says the following, that the, the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x raised to the power n equals to 0 and the limit as x approaches negative infinity so that's what I want to write here so minus infinity of a function 1 over x raised to the power n is also equal to 0 whenever that n is strictly greater than 0 so this is an important um, tool to have. So this machinery is required when we're answering other complicated questions. Now what is the strategy when you are taking limits at infinity for rational functions? This is a rational function. It's a polynomial divided by a polynomial. So what you have to do is step one, find the highest power in the denominator. And looking at the denominator, meaning the bottom of the fraction, what is the highest power of the variable x? So this um, function has variables x in it. If it was in terms of y, then you will find the highest power of the variable y. If I changed it to w, you'll find the highest power of the variable w. So keep that in mind. Um, right, so we're finding the highest power of x in the denominator. So you're always going to pick the highest power from the bottom. Observe that the highest power of x is x squared. So once you've done that, divide each term by x squared. Right, so I shall do that mentally. Right, so limit as x approaches infinity. So I now need to take x squared divided by x squared. So I get 1. Then I've got 1 divided by x squared. So that's I'm just going to have to write it down as 1 divided by x squared. Then I go to the denominator. And I've got 7, so I now need to divide that by x squared. So I'm going to write that down as 7 over x squared. And I've got minus 2x divided by x squared, so that's just going to give me 2 over x. And then I've got 8x squared divided by, 8, uh, divided by x squared, which is just 8. Right, so that's what I've got in there. So now simplifying, I can now distribute the limit into the numerator and to the denominator. So this is the limit of 1 as x approaches infinity. Then I've got the limit of 1 over x squared as x approaches infinity going to the denominator. This is 7 over x squared, but I can pull out the 7 since it's a constant. And so this is the limit of 1 over x squared as x approaches infinity. Looking at the next term, minus 2 over x, once again, I can pull out the constant. And this is the limit of 1 over x as x approaches infinity. And lastly, we've got the constant. So we're taking the limit as x approaches infinity of the constant 8. Right, so now we could use all of our properties that we've learned about limits as well as that rule star that I've told you. So use star. So star tells you that whenever you have 1 divided by the variable x raised to some power that is bigger than 0, the limit at infinity is equal to 0. So here is one such form where n is 2, so that is 0. Here is another again, n is 2, so that equals to 0. Here is another, it's raised to the power 1, 
So that's also zero. So we know we've got zeros in there. What is the limit of a constant? Uh, regardless of what the x value approaches, it gives you back the constant. That's a property that I've listed for you in your notes. So this is 1 plus, sorry, it's 1 minus 0. That's a negative sign. Divided by 7 times 0, minus 2 times 0, plus limit of a constant again. It's going to give you back that constant, so 8. And therefore, it is 1 over 8. And that's the final answer. So make sure that you understand the procedure for limits at infinity.